We do want to extend a very special welcome to all visitors that are with us this morning. We encourage you to worship with us at every opportunity that you have. We're very, very happy that you're here with us in person, but we're also very happy if you're visiting with us uh, online. Uh, we meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. with Bible classes at 1015. We meet on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, and then we meet every Wednesday for our midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. If you would like to go ahead and take out your Bibles and mark the scripture reading for this morning's lesson, it's going to be taken from Mark chapter 8, verse 21. It's Mark chapter 8, verse 21. As we begin our worship, our first song will be number 694, number 694, and if you would please stand. The first two and the last two verses. <clears throat> To Canaan's land I bore my way where the soul Father, which art in heaven, we humbly bow before you today and thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us and the opportunity that you've given us that we can gather together without fear of persecution. And Father, we especially thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, through his life, through his death on the cross, and through his resurrection, that we have hope in eternity that by through faith and through obedience to your word that we can one day inherit that home in heaven with you. And Father, we, we thank you so much for your son. We pray also, Father, that each one of us that have obeyed the gospel and that are faithful, that will also be reminded of your commitment to us and to your command to us that we should go out throughout the world and to spread the gospel. We pray, Father, that we'll <coughs> seek that opportunity each and every day as we walk through this life. Father, this morning as we gather, we know there are those that are unable to be here with us due to illness. Father, we also have those who are able to be with us but are still recovering from illness or injury some that are continuing to take treatments for illnesses. And Father, this morning, 
We pray that you'll be with Sister Martha Cathy, Howard Whitty, with June Crouch, Steve Nearing, and Dale Zuna, and Margaret Schillinger. Pray also that you'll be with Jewel Thomason, George Vandegriff, Marty York, and Mike Lee. And Father, for these and for others, perhaps, that we're not aware of, we pray, Father, that you'll be with them, that you'll be a comfort to them, that if it be thy will, you'll help restore them to a normal walk of life. And we pray that you'll be with their families and their caregivers during this time as they help and assist them. Father, also, we know that there are those of our congregation that have been touched by the death of a loved one. And Father, this morning we especially pray for the Ferris Young family. Pray you continue to be with them and be with others too, Father, that have lost loved ones over the past few months, even year. Pray that you will be a comfort to them as they reach out to you in prayer and as they glean from your word. Father, this morning as we gather as a congregation, we thank you for each and every member of this congregation, each and every person who chooses to enter the doors, each person who chooses, who makes the choice to worship with us, Father. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for the work that this congregation does. Each endeavor that, that comes available for those who raise their hand and stand up to be counted and to be a part of your family and to be a part of the work here at our congregation. We pray that you'll continue to bless your family here. We pray that you'll continue to bless your family all over the world where faithful saints are meeting together. We pray that you'll help us always keep a mindset that our goal is to spread the gospel, to edify one another, and to be of help to each other. Father, for we know sometimes just the assistance to someone else can be a kind word or a smile. And Father, we know that there are other needs. We pray, Father, that if you'll be with us, that you'll help us to understand those needs and to be able to make ourselves available. So many opportunities, Father, to teach as a part of classes, or vacation Bible school, or other opportunities that we have to spread the gospel. Father, we thank you for our elders and our deacons here. We pray that you'll be with us as we continue to work to lead the congregation. Help us make those decisions that would be aligned with your will and with what we glean from your word. And Father, that we can strengthen. And again, Father, with our goal to help spread the gospel. Father, we know that our country is far from you right now. We know that oftentimes it seems that those in our country today want to remove you from our lives, want to remove your will from, from how we live our daily lives. Father, we don't pray for retribution. We don't, play, we don't pray for vengeance. Father, we pray for time. We pray for time and the opportunity that we have to reach these individuals, to read God's word to them, to study your word with them, and to give them the opportunity to redeem themselves, to understand where they may be error, and where that they too can have the opportunity to obey the gospel. Father, we thank you for all of those men and women who put on the uniform whether it be in our military or police, EMT, fire, all those men and women who help in our community, in our country, and abroad. We know their sacrifice is great sometimes, Father. We pray that you'll be with their families. And we, again, if it be thy will, we pray that you will help them in difficult times, make the right decisions, but also to be able to return home. Father, this morning as we continue through this service, we pray that you'll be with all of us. We'll put the cares of this world, we'll put the thoughts of the day away. And for just the next few moments, Father, that we'll concentrate on a service, a worship to you that is holy in thy name. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. For the offering this morning, we'll sing number 495. 495. <clears throat> 
Oh, the depths and the riches of God's saving grace, flowing down from the cross for me. plates in the entryway for those that wish to contribute to the work of the church and the elders have chosen this as a, a convenient time for us to stop and pause in our worship for a moment of reflection to prayerfully consider giving to the work of the church the money that's given goes not only to the physical plan of the, the church and the grounds but also to the spreading of the gospel here in the congregation and in the community and the state and worldwide it goes on further to those that, uh, not only of the congregation, but of the community that have unmet needs that the church can help with. And it goes for very important purposes. There's a time in the, the life of Christ that relates to what we're doing now. It's recorded in Mark chapter 12, and beginning in verse 41. It says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they have put in of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. When we consider giving a gift to the church and a contribution to the work of the church, it's not about how much, it's about how we give it. Would you prayerfully consider and bow with me now? Father, we are so blessed in this world. Even in times of financial struggle, we have more than so many people in this world. We have our homes, we have our jobs and our families, we have our livelihoods. We're so grateful for all of that. And as we consider giving a portion of that back, we pray that each one of us would do it in a way that would please you, that we would do it out of humility and not out of pride, that we would do it with caring hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the invitation to him this morning will be number 380 after the lesson this morning. And to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 203. Remember what our Savior did for us as we sing this song. <clears throat> Man of sorrows, what a day for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim.
there's anyone that needs a communion pack, if you would raise your hand and the ushers will be happy to bring one to you. I had a very pleasant surprise this weekend. I had a few minutes, I turned on YouTube, because that's what we do now when we have a few minutes. And I turned to a congregation that's uh, outside the county and the thumbnail for last Sunday night, I was pleasantly surprised my cousin was standing at the lectern. It was his night to fill in to preach. And this is not just any cousin, this is the one just older than me, so he is the one I have chased my whole life and tried to keep up with and tried to live up to. And it was very timely, the sermon that he had, because I was gonna stand here for the Lord's Supper. He quoted an interview with a man uh, who was a very well-known man, apparently, I, I didn't know him though. But he, uh, he asked him, said, what is the most important thing you've ever learned? So he paused for a moment and he said, I have learned this, that Jesus loves me. And to quote my cousin, he said, of all of the things that were said at the cross and all of the words and the sermons and the articles and the books that have been written of those words that Jesus said on the cross, the most important one wasn't verbalized. The most important one was that as he was on the cross, we look at that cross and we see that he says, no one loves you more than me. John chapter 15 and verse 13, Jesus is speaking with his disciples and he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He continues on to say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And we think about that for a moment, no greater love than to lay your life down. It wasn't verbalized on the cross, but he told them this is what's going to happen, and that he was going to do it because of the love that he had for mankind. Not just them, those that had been before and those of us that came after. As we stop and, and focus our minds for the Lord's Supper, we ask that you would consider that love that was on the cross, that love that was given to us. Sometimes in our lives we, we do things that make us separated or feel separated from that love that we, was shown to us. But there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. As we prepare to take of the bread, would you bow with me? Father, we are so humbled that you would send your son to go through the painful death on the cross. And we are so humbled by the love that you showed there. And Father, we pray that each one of us that partake of this bread that represents the body that was broken there on the cross, we pray that we would keep in mind the love that you have for us, that we would take this bread in a way that would be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you bow with me again? And Father, in like manner, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed, help us all to be grateful for the forgiveness that you've been given, that you have given to us. Help us to focus our minds and our lives on you and help us, help us to take this in a way that would please you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Scripture reading this morning is Mark chapter 8, verse 21. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? It's always a privilege to be able to stand in the pulpit and preach God's word. 
And I am thankful this morning that each of you are here and thankful that each of you have your hearts and your minds focused on worshiping God. And we're studying through the account of Mark of the life of Christ. And we come to chapter 8 and verse 21 where the Lord asked the question, Do you not understand? How is it that you do not understand? Have you ever struggled yourself with understanding what was said by the Lord? As you took your Bible and you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the Lord's words, did you understand what he was saying? Now, we realize that at some point, we as the disciples of the Lord should be able to get what he is saying. When the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote about people understanding, he said in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, of whom I have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. I think about what that says and how important it is for each of us to realize it's our obligation to grow in our knowledge and understanding, to be able to grasp what the Lord was saying as we read his word. Well, in Mark chapter 8, there is within this section a great lesson about understanding what he had to say. And so I want to invite you Take your Bibles. Let's open them. Let's don't just depend on someone else telling us. Let's open our own Bibles. And whether it's on your electronic device or whether it's the pew Bible in front of you or your own Bible that you have in your hand, let me encourage you. Let's read and study along. There are going to be three things that I want us to accomplish as we study through this section. The first will be the occasion of the Lord. That will be the majority of our lesson. Second of all will be the opportunities to learn. They were given some opportunities as we are opportunities to learn. And then finally, some objectives to live by. So let's begin, first of all, let's go back to verse 10. And let's see the Lord. It says there, immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and they came to the region of Dalmanutha. I know most of you would say, I have no idea where that's at. But if I read Matthew's account, and as he sent away the multitude, he got into the boat and came to the region of Magdala. Now, you do know where that's at. That's where Mary Magdalene was from. It was a city not far from Capernaum. It's on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there the Lord came into that region, and uh, we understand regions may have similar names. A person may say, for instance, I'm going to the Smoky Mountains, or I'm going to Pigeon Forge, or I'm going to East Tennessee. All of those would be the same area. And the Lord is now coming to the area of Magdala. But what's important here is what we read in verses 10, and, or verses 11 and 12, is we read about the Lord's confrontation with the Pharisees. Here's what Mark tells us. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, No sign shall be given to this generation. If you'll notice with me, there are three present tense uh, verbs here describing what was going on. And for just a minute, let me remind you what that means. Whenever you see the present tense, that means it's something that's ongoing. It's not just a one and done. It's, It's ongoing. And so the first thing we learn is they are arguing with the Lord. They're disputing with him. They're debating with him. They're pressing their differences. There was not a very pleasant situation. You have the Lord and you have these Pharisees gathered around him. And I can see them peppering him with, well, did you do this? Did you do that? But the second thing that you'll see is this word, seeking a sign. 
They are looking for miracles to impress them because it is ongoing. I can see one of them saying, well, show us a sign. Do something so that we may believe in you. You see, if I go to John's account, John said in John chapter 4, verse 48, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. That's what they've been asking for. Show us something and we'll believe in you. Show us something. Prove that you are the Son of God. The Lord knew that that wouldn't work with them because in chapter 12, verse 37, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. It didn't matter what Jesus did. It didn't matter how he lived because they were not going to believe anyway because they already had their minds made up. And you can say, well, are you sure about that? Well, go to chapter 11 and verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? We see the signs. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to deal with this? Rather than simply saying the Lord has proved who he was, but they were constantly pushing the Lord, debating with the Lord, seeking a sign from him. And then the last term that Mark uses, testing him. Testing him. I would say they were trying the Lord's patience. Not only were they trying his patience, they were constantly seeing what he was going to do in response to what they were going to say. In Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 15, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when he, they had come, he, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and that you care about no one and you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a Daenerys that I may see it. And he goes on to say, Whose inscription is on it? Well, it's Caesar's. We'll render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You see, they were testing him. They were trying to catch him in his words. They were trying to watch Jesus give us a sign, debating with him, testing him. But then Luke 20, verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness and said to them, why do you test me? They're crafty. They're trying to catch the Lord. Look at verse 12 again. It said, the Lord sighed deeply in his spirit. Why is the Lord so discouraged? And the reason is because they're not seeking the truth. They're seeking to score points. They're trying to embarrass the Lord in front of that multitude of crowd. You see, they already have their minds made up, but what they want to do is they want to turn the crowds against the Lord. They're wanting to embarrass him. Well, now pick up with me at verse 13. Let's go through verse 15. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Now, I know when you read that, you, you tend to think, well, they're getting on the boat, they're going, and they've only got one loaf. That's not enough food to feed 13 men. When you think of a loaf, don't think of what we might think of as a loaf of light bread that you would buy at the grocery store. Think of a flat bread, much like Nahum bread, and there's just one of them. And how much would that go among 13 men, the 12 apostles and the Lord, as they're crossing across? And so there's not enough. But on that occasion, the Lord used that as a way to tell them to beware of the leaven 
of the Pharisees and that of the Herodians or those of Herod. You see, that was an important part because leaven is the rising agent in bread. We call it yeast. You can read about it in a number of passages. In Luke chapter 13, the Lord even used a parable of that. He said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. In other words, you, you put it in the middle of the bread, you knead the dough, and the leaven spreads. Galatians 5 verse 9 says, do you not know the little leaven? Leaven's the whole lump. You don't have to have a lot of it for it to have a powerful impact over all of it. Well, there's the leaven here of the attitude that was influencing these disciples of the Lord. And he's trying to warn them about being aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herodians. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, these two groups had often joined forces in trying to confront the Lord. You know, reading just later in Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. These were not people on the same side. The Pharisees and the Herodians had two very distinct attitudes. They didn't like one another, but the old phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, that's exactly the way they thought. As long as they were opposed to the Lord, they would join forces with the others. Now, the Pharisees were noted for their bad theology. What do you mean by that? Well, they would say and do not. They would tell people, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And they wouldn't do it themselves. But even worse than that, they would portray themselves as the religious, devout people. The clothes that they wore, the way they conducted themselves, the length of their prayers was all to tell people, look how spiritual I am. While the Lord described them, he said, you're outwardly like whitewashed tombs, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. That's what you are. But then there were the Rodians who followed the Herods, and they were bad politicians because for them it was all about the materialistic things of life, how much you could get in this world, and the power and the influence. So you take the Herodians and you take the Pharisees, and the Lord said, You've got to beware of their leaven, of their influence. What that did was to prompt the Lord to ask seven questions of them. Let's read verses 16 through 21. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets of fragments did you take up? They said, seven. He said to them, so how is it that you do not understand? How is it that you do not understand? Notice with me, if you will, these seven questions. And just think with me, because we're, we're trying to understand what the Lord's saying. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Why do you think I am talking about bread? He had just said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, that of Herod. And now he said, why are you thinking that way? Number two, do you not yet perceive or understand? Has it not dawned on you what I'm talking about? The word yet means it's not gotten to you at this point. Next one, is your heart still hardened? If you say it's still hardened, that means it was and it is still that way. They were not thinking the right way. They had already let that leaven influence them. 
And so he asked, having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And he says, do you not remember? You think about that for just a moment. Do you not remember what the Lord did? The feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000? He said, don't you remember what took place then? Does the Lord have that ability? And so his final question is, how is it that you do not understand? I think at this point, most of us would have to say, were they not paying good attention? Were they not listening carefully to the Lord? Were they not grasping what he was trying to get across? Well, what that does is that points to the fact that they had at least two opportunities where they should have learned. Now, let me just briefly, and I'm just going to make reference to the fact that you go back to the ones that he had pointed to. Going back to Mark 6, verses 30 through 44, we studied about that earlier, where the Lord fed them 5,000 men with five loaves and two small fish. That's just beyond comprehension. Five small loaves and two small fish, and and you can feed people and take up 12 baskets of fragments? Well, what about in Mark chapter 8, the first part of this chapter? We've not considered it yet in one of our lessons, but I wanted to draw attention to the fact that here's where the Lord fed 4,000. And they took up seven large baskets. The question is, does the Lord have the ability to provide food from that one loaf that they had? Well, most certainly he does. If he could feed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish, could he also feed them from one loaf? Absolutely he could. If it was simply a matter of food, the Lord could easily have supplied everything that they needed. In fact, the Lord has always done that for them. Always. Let me use a, what I think is a good illustration. The Lord, when he sent the disciples out on the limited commission, sent them out and told them, he said, in verse 8 of chapter 6, he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts. You don't need anything. Well, Lord, maybe we ought to carry some bread with us. No. Maybe we ought to carry some money with us. No. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 35. And he said to them, when I sent you out without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? And so they said to him, nothing. We didn't lack anything. I want you to know the Lord is always taking care of his people. That's the reason why when we study passages like Matthew chapter 6, where the Lord says, take no thought of what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll put on. It's not the life more than food and the body more than clothing. And then the Lord begins to explain that he's always taken care of his people. He takes care of the birds of the heaven. He takes care of the grasses of the field. And he'll take care of us too. You see, Jesus often had to explain his teachings to his disciples. Now, again, I'm not going to go into great detail. I just simply want to touch a few points here. You go to Mark chapter 4. And the Lord had given the parable of the sower. You know, the seed that fell on good ground, that fell on thorny ground, that fell on uh, thorny ground, and fell on the wayside. And you read in verse 10, it says, But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those on the outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sin should be forgiven them. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Probably the easiest to understand of all the parables the Lord gave was this first one, the parable of the sower. And they're saying, Lord, what does it really mean? Or you go a little bit further to chapter 7 and verse 17. 
and they have been challenged, you know, Lord, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? We talked about that ceremonial washing that they did. And the Lord said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him that defiles him. And in verse 17, when he had entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. Lord, what did you mean by that? What's the meaning of it? In chapter 10, the Lord's going to be approached again by a group of people trying to test him. And it says in verse 2, the Pharisees came and asked him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And the Lord responds that there's just one cause for which a man can put away his wife, and that is if his spouse commits fornication. And in verse 10, in the house, his disciples also ask him again about the same matter. Lord, you got to explain that to us. Or you go to Mark 13, verse 3. The Lord is sitting on the Mount of Olives with Peter, James, and John, and they're asking him privately about what he means when he says not one stone will be left upon another. You see, the Lord was constantly having to explain things to his disciples. Are you not thankful that God has put in Scripture not only the fact of what happened and what the Lord taught, but the questions the disciples ask and the Lord's answers. You know why he did that? Because that's an opportunity for us to learn and understand. And these became opportunities to teach and to learn. And what that does, that leads us into the objectives here. And I think there's several lessons that I would want to walk away with, things that I want to know and understand. And the first one is, is that when the Lord warns them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians, he points out that we're subject to the influence of other people. All of us are. In fact, when Paul writes the Corinthians, he tells them in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. We would say if you hang around with bad people, they're going to rub off on you. The opposite of that is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. We need to realize that there are people whose fellowship, whose presence we need to have in our lives, the good people. There are people whose presence and fellowship we don't need to have in our lives, and that is the bad people. And the Lord's warning them about these. But you take that a little bit further. And I think we have to be on our guard lest we allow others to influence us regarding what the Lord taught. Can I allow people to persuade me to believe what I want to believe rather than what the Lord said? Absolutely. In that case, you have to be careful to whom you listen. You have to be careful that you check what every person says. Do you hear what I said? Every person says. You can't rely upon someone else to tell you what to believe. You need to know yourself. The King James reading of 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Each of us has our own obligation to be able to listen what someone else says and say, is that person influencing me in the right direction or the wrong direction? Is he telling me what God has said or what he wants us to believe? We must never allow ourselves to become hypocrites pretending to care about what the Lord taught and not follow it. That's the reason why the Lord warns them against this hypocrisy that exists among the Pharisees. Don't allow yourself to be projecting to everybody else, oh, here I am. I am this righteous, godly person who you ought to follow because how great I am. 
the Lord condemned that kind of arrogance. He compared the Pharisee and the tax collector who tried to look at himself. It says he trusted himself that he was righteous and despised others. We've got to avoid allowing that to be a part of us. The second objective, I think, is part of this is why do you go to the Bible? Is it to listen, to learn, to know how to seek the Lord, or is it to score points? Now, I will tell you that there's a lot of people that when it comes time to discuss the Bible with their neighbors, will say, now get him on that point. Make sure you, you, you let him know we're right and he's wrong. You see, if your goal in going to the Bible is to prove something to somebody else or maybe even to, to try to prove it yourself, you're very likely not to listen and learn because you think you already know what you want to do. We need to be people who are humble before God's Word and are willing to say, what does it say? And listen carefully to it. Lord frequently used figures of speech. In fact, that's what the parables were. It's figures of speech. And we have to be careful that when we take those passages, we understand what he's saying. We have to look at, first of all, the passages which are literal and use them to help us understand those that are figurative. Again, just touching a few bases here. In John chapter 8 and verse 27, Jesus said, I'm going away. And in their minds, well, is he going to go to this city? Is he going to go to another place? And we read, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. I'm going to go back where the Father's at. They didn't grasp that. Or you go to John chapter 10 and verse 6. Jesus talks about being the true shepherd of the sheep. In verse 6, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Here's our problem sometimes. We just read superficially. We just smooth over things rather than listen carefully to what the Lord has to say. Now, I'll be honest. I think we all struggle at times to perfectly know the teachings of our Lord. There are times when perhaps you and I are reading through and we, we scratch our head and say, is this what he's saying or is that what he's saying? But I will tell you what the Lord said is if we will listen and learn, we can grasp what he's saying. In John 7 and verse 17, he says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority, you will to do his will. How badly do you want to know how much effort are you going to put in to understand? He said, if you'll do it, you can know it. But there's one part of the Lord's teaching which is abundantly clear, a part of it which is so plain that you can't misunderstand it. Now, I know there are people who will twist it. But the Lord said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. I don't think you can make it any simpler than that. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. He gave the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This morning, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you do, why not be willing to confess and say, I believe that, turning from your sins, then to be baptized. There's a baptistry behind me. There's clothing that is prepared. All that is waiting is your choice. If you need to become a Christian this morning, why not now? 
And if you're a child of God straying into the sins of the world, why not come home? We're going to sing the song, Just As I Am. That's an old song. It's a powerful song. And if we'll listen to the words of it, it'll certainly convict us if we need to be. Would you come as we stand and sing? Just as I am with Once again, thank you so much for choosing to come and worship God with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, we thank you for choosing Bappy Branch to worship God today. Hope you'll come back and see us whenever you can. In just a few minutes, Bible classes will begin, and they'll be over with at 11 o'clock. Please take advantage of those chances to learn more of God's Word if you, if you have the opportunity. <clears throat> the evening service will be this evening at 6 p.m. And let's don't forget our friends and family day on June the 30th. Phil Sanders will be here. We'll have lunch, and we hope this will be a great day. Please make your plans now to be back this evening for our 6 p.m. worship. And now Brother Paul is going to lead us in this final hymn, and we'll be dismissed with a prayer. This song I pick sometimes as the end, but as the life of a flower reminds me of time and how... Beautiful flowers are in their own time. And the one that I always think of when I think of this is one that you see obvious at the beginning of spring is buttercups. After everything's been dead all year long, those buttercups are always nice and bright when they come up. And I think as our lives as Christians, as song sings, our lives should be like that flower that everybody sees in their time. In their time, there's flowers that bloom at different times. But I feel like the flower is something that we should be like. So as we sing this, let's think of that. <clears throat> as a life of a flower, as a bread for a sun, so the years that we live as a dream passing by. True today we are here, but tomorrow.
Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee again for a, another day to come in thy church and worship thee, sing songs of praise, read and study thy Bible, and that we may do so in a way that we rightly divide thy word, showing ourselves approved unto thee, that we may do things in a godly manner, in a godly way, in a Christian way. Father, we pray, Father, for the sick, the one that's been mentioned here today, to be thy will, restore them back to the normal morning places in life, wherever they may be. Continue, Lord, to bless the ones who have lost loved ones recently. We pray that you would bless them, comfort them, give them strength and courage to carry on in their lives and to, to get through their grieving ways. We thank thee, Lord, for the good lesson that Brother Tony has brought us, that we may uh, take Take it with us, Lord, that we may learn more about thy word and thy ways in a Christian way. Continue to bless us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. And when we come to the end of life's journey here on this earth, we pray that you give us a home in heaven with thee. So we ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah.